Hi, everyone. We're going to give it a second for folks to join before we kick off our third session of Shifting Paradigms. Thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight. This is the second annual Shifting Paradigms Conference from Physicians for Social Responsibility, Pennsylvania. Tonight's conversation will be with Justin Noble. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please feel free to share any resources and insights in the chat. If you could put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the page, that would be greatly appreciated. It gets a little difficult to track comments that are happening in the chat. Um, with that, I'm actually going to pass it over to Tammy Murphy. There we go, unmuted. Okay, hi, I am Tammy Murphy. I'm the Advocacy Director uh, with Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we are going to have a nice conversation. Um, I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, Laura Dagley and Christina DiGiulio. And we're here with acclaimed science journalist, Justin Noble. And um, Justin, um, we're all going to uh, introduce ourselves, but just to let you know, Justin is the author of Petroleum 238, uh, Big Oil's Dangerous Secret and the Grassroots Fight to Stop It. It's due out on April 24th and can be pre-ordered now. I'm gonna put that information um, into the chat. And um, Laura, do you wanna introduce yourself? And then maybe Chris and then Justin, you can jump in, introduce yourself and tell us about the book. Yeah, um, I'm Laura. I am a nurse and I'm the medical and environmental health writer um, for PSR and um, I'm based in Pittsburgh. Hi, uh, my name is Chris DiGiulio, also known as PK. Justin <laughs> knows that. Um, I am the environmental chemist for Physicians for Social Responsibility of Pennsylvania and I'm so happy to be here. And Justin, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about this book, um, I'm putting the links in the chat now as we speak. Yeah, thank you so much, um, PSR, for hosting and putting on an event like this, um, connecting different communities in different parts of the country that are uh, trying to hold oil and gas industry accountable on a variety of issues. I am a science and environmental journalist. I've spent a lot of time in uh, Louisiana, actually, and other parts of the country reporting on various in, uh, issues connected to um, petrochemical industry, oil and gas industry. And recently, um, maybe six years ago, I fell down this rabbit hole of radioactive oil field waste, oil field radioactivity um, almost doesn't seem real. Uh, or it seems strange if maybe you don't know a lot about the industry. And I was staring at the industry for quite some time before I really put the pieces together on this topic. I'm excited to present, especially to this group, because I think there is a lot of harms connected to this issue, but there's also a lot of ways to hold the industry accountable. Um, there's a lot of ways to track and visualize and see this contamination uh, that sometimes is hard when you have a polluting industry. And so it's it's really, we were just talking about this, it's like sharing this secret code. Um, and I think from a public health perspective, there's concerns, but there's also a lot of ways to move forward once you know exactly what's happening with oil field waste. I'm excited to present on that to everyone. We are excited to have you. Um, so I just wanna say a little bit about how I got to know Justin. Um, when I first started working um, for Physicians for Social Responsibility Philadelphia at the time. Um, we were the Philadelphia chapter. And um, I think you met with Dr. Pune Sabiri. Um, and then um, you were touring around with Chris around the Mariner East. Um, and then uh, we uh, met so that I could take you up to Dimmick, Pennsylvania. 
And uh, it was a, it was an interesting car ride because I was really new to the field and like just trying to kind of figure a lot of stuff out. And I had no idea who you were or what you knew. And I was kind of a little bit nervous that like, oh my God, I hope I explain what fracking is, right? If that's, you know, like what information you wanted to know or like what I knew about Pennsylvania. And then, you know, it took me about two minutes to realize that you knew way more than I did, uh, obviously. And you knew way more people and you'd been all over the place and you had so much information to tell me. And uh, it's just, it was very interesting too, how like that conversation quickly um, became very comfortable and very personable. And, um, you know, it just kind of felt like an immediate friendship. And then I, I started to realize like how talented you are at making people comfortable to tell their stories. And that's something I've always been like amazed to hear the, the things that you learn and the things that people talk to you about that or it can be otherwise uncomfortable and even scary to talk about. But there's just uh, something about you, your passion and um, you're, you know, very comfortable to speak with. So I think it's great that you are um, looking into such a complicated and serious situation um, and getting people to talk. <clears throat> so Laura and Chris, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about what you, when you guys all met or whatever. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> as my, I don't think mine is uh, as exciting as Tammy's, but I, I think I first heard Justin speak at the League of Women Voters Shale and Public Health Conference. And I just um, remember thinking that you, um, you know, I feel like everybody there was in like suits and ties and then, <laughs> and, and Justin shows up and like, you know, you know, probably something like he's wearing now and just like is like a better presentation than uh, everybody there. Um, that was just so well um, explained. I, it just, I mean, he was talking about issues that um, I didn't understand very well, but I, he did such like a, a great way of um, making it very accessible, I think, to everybody who was listening. And um, and then I think it was not long after that, Tammy said we were going to be working with him um, on a research project with um, Wayne State University. But I'll, um, I'll let Chris talk about. Um, yeah, Justin. I mean, I came from a little bit of a different realm. I, I was a watchdog, not getting paid. I was not working. And Justin kind of, I don't know, through Tammy or whatever, picked me up. It was just like, you're kind of crazy. You're taking the data. You're doing the things. And um, he listened. I think that was what the, the most amazing part was he actually listened to me. And um, like, yeah, what Tammy said. I thought I was going to be talking about like the Mariner East, but he was more or less like, tell me about you. Chris DiGiulio or PK, who you are. And he wanted to know where this person came from that's doing this crazy work, which is like basically makes a lot of sense because foundationally we've learned like a lot of the foundations of this fight. And like, it's very important to have a solid foundation. It's kind of like he was like a, a, trying to figure out these people who he's like interviewing, like what kind of foundation do you have? Like, what's your foundation in this? Um, and um, I, I did tour him. He had to r ride around in my little hoopty truck and and wrote about my my motorcycle experience which was kind of weird for a minute justin thanks for all that like me getting contaminated by radiation was not necessarily something i wanted to be reminded of but like actually taught me to be like very much so more careful about what i do out here because it was real and the fact that he um zoned in on that and wanted to hear me talk about it more actually made me think about as a watchdog that I need to be taking some precautions on my own and being very aware of this because you just don't go out and do this like some kind of, excuse my language, but badass. This is a conversation. So I'm going to say, it. Um, you know, that's, that's a little bit ego driven. And, and in fact, we're trying to protect other people. And if I go out there in, in people's communities that are not as protected, like I have to be very conscious of that for myself. Um, it really brought me into it and an understanding of like the work we're really doing. So thank you, Justin. That's my experience, but also a wonderful person to talk to, knowledgeable. And I love that, you know, Justin knows his science. So that that's that's where I I fall in line with him. Um, all right. That's really um it's thank you. Uh it's just nice to, you know, get to know a group of folks. So um everyone at PSR, thank you. It's really special work you're doing and you know to people in communities people in health groups across the country i 
I say this often, but it's so true. I mean, you all are the front lines of investigative journalism, science journalism. Um, there's a lot of interesting research and, and that's an amazing record that exists, this thing we call science. And I rely on that a lot, but I have to rely and, and enjoyably rely on, on going into communities, which means connecting with groups or even just one individual who's paying attention to something uh, whether it's, you know, more formally collecting data or just snapping photos or, you know, like internally processing the damage that's happening. Um, I know that can be really traumatic. I know that can be overwhelming, um, but it is it also builds this record. Um, it's a scientific record and it's an emotional record. And it's something that storytellers like me can draw on. Uh, and, and it's essential, you know, that I connect with groups like you. And, and I am happy to be able to present back um, the information that it really, in a way, you helped lead me to. So um, I will, um, I'll draw up the PowerPoint presentation. Is that, should I do that? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so I'm gonna share the screen. And, um, Okay. Is that the book cover? Yeah. So nice. can everyone, can you see, see it? All I see right. It. Yeah. I, I, I see your, yeah, your slides. Super. Okay. And I'm just loading this up. So first I just want to say, um, beautiful, beautiful photo. I mean, this photo really, um, conveys a lot. And this is an amazing Louisiana photographer, Julie Dermansky. She has been covering oil and gas and fracking really longer than any other journalist, photojournalist or writer I know. And, um, and, and again, this idea of like, is this even real? I mean, this is a home in Louisiana that is right next to a refinery. Um, and how this happens is, is just rigorous, dedicated work of people like Julie on the ground, um, often well-connected with grassroots groups, but, but following things and just, you know, this becomes your life. Um, and, and when that happens, you can get really close to a topic. Um, and there's no one closer than her. And then working with a great graphic artist named Sabrina Bedford. Um, and, uh, and also working with my girlfriend, who's a designer, and we, and we help put this cover together. Um, and this leads us into the book. Um, pre-order link, yeah, that's exciting. That's a cool thing you can do now. You can order a book before. This will take you to a page where you can buy it on bookshop.org, which helps support local bookstores or Amazon. But um, it's so important, I think, to get this message into local bookstores. So I'm encouraging everyone, you know, if you have a local independent bookstore you like, go to them and be like, you've got to get this on your shelves come this spring, because I really want to, I so appreciate this community, but I also want to make sure the random person who knows nothing that oil and gas might even be a problem can walk in and learn about this topic um, and then pass it on to others. And bo bookstores are, are often really great places, local bookstores where you can do that. Um, so I'm just starting with this quote here, which just helps like break this topic down um, and makes it very accessible. A fantastic nuclear forensic scientist I work with, and he tells me essentially what you're doing with oil and gas is taking an underground radioactive reservoir and bringing it up to the biosphere where it can interact with people in the environment. The biosphere, that's just the surface of the earth, the part of the earth, life happens in where we live. So it suddenly becomes, at least for me here, not so complicated. Oil and gas exist in a very contaminated and gunky formation. There's a lot of different elements down there. Heavy metals, radioactive elements, you're pulling them out, you're bringing them up to the surface and you're spill, spread, injecting, slathering them across the land in all sorts of different sloppy ways, um, we're gonna have harms uh, and, and radioactivity is a part of that. And when you talk to the right scientists, they can help you understand that um, easy and, and then start to paint a picture of what's happening here. Um, and this is like a really simple drawing, just trying to lay out what's happening as a well uh, what's happening at a wellhead, and I and and it's um, it really is this simple. There's a couple different ways we've gone about getting oil and gas in this country. Typically, before the modern fracking boom, we relied on this oil and gas that was pretty easy to access. Um, once you went through the act of drilling, you hit the the bulge of fuel essentially that's stuck underground. 
uh, and, it, and it either fountains out at the surface, like you can imagine in Oklahoma or, you know, West Texas, or the gas will rush out in a roar. The, the fuel comes out with a little coaxing sometimes, but sometimes it just comes right out. Now, uh, for the most part, we are harnessing oil and gas that's stuck in what really is the mother load formation. And one of the problems with fracking, among many radioactivity issues, is you're cracking in to a black shale formation. A black shale formation is where most of the oil and gas across the world was actually formed. So you have, imagine like the Gulf of Mexico today, a shallow marine environment. You have rivers bringing different elements in from the land and you have a lot of organisms, organic life in the sea, little marine algae dies, falls to the bottom. That's your future oil and gas, but you also have these sediments coming in and you have uh, coming off the land um, radioactive elements that are building up in that layer that will become your future oil and gas deposits. So long-lived radioactive elements, things like uranium and thorium. By long-lived, that just means it takes them a very long time to shoot off the radiation and then become another element. So they're still there. The uranium that sank to the bottom of the sea and mixed in with the oil and gas formation is often still there as the same type of uranium. Um, and with oil and gas, this is a new thing. We, we weren't always going down to actual black shale formations. We were trying to get at them. Now we can get at them. And in order to do that, we drill down vertically and then we go horizontally through it. So all of the dirt and rocks we pull out of the black shale formation can potentially pose a radioactivity problem as well. And this is, um, I just was talking to a filmmaker and this blew them away, but the industry, especially in the Marcellus, use the radioactive nature of the formation to actually find the formation. And there's a shocking um, scientific paper from the from the pencil, uh, I think it's the Pennsylvania Department of um, uh, one of their mineral resources department within the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and a geologist says um, organic richness equals radioactivity equals oil and gas. Uh, and that's in caps in this paper. So that's really just saying, and the oil industry knew this, if we can find the radioactivity, uh, we can find the oil and gas. And so right away from the beginning, they actually use that to find it. That becomes a problem when you pull it up to the surface. But we had problems even before that with radioactivity. Oil and gas inherently brings up this really toxic liquid waste stream, which the industry often calls brine or produced water. If you put brine or produced water in a tank, uh, you're going to form a sludge. So just to focus on the brine for a second, this is uh, coming from a worker. It's a wellhead in the Marcellus Utica area. I think this is Eastern Ohio. And you have this moment in the, in the production cycle of a well where you're, where all this brine and, and at that point, the industry called that flowback, all this liquid waste is going to surge up out of the well. And you need literally an army of trucks there to gather it. Um, and I'll go to some slides in a second. This is uh, not new. Industry since day one, which in the U.S. is 1859, Titusville, Pennsylvania, that's the first commercial well, has always brought up the brine, has never had a good idea of what to do with it. Um, now at least we have, you know, this army of trucks to gather it, but there's still problems. But this is just, I mean, this visual is amazing of like how much waste, and that's just in one moment of production. This waste will keep coming. Uh, and again, there is the radioactive signature. So what does that really mean um, with brine? Um, it's going to mean there is an element called radium. I'll get back to that in just a second. This is a wonderful historical document. And this was a really important part of the reporting being led to this, you know, interesting uh, early references from the industry or from the regulatory community showing that there's a problem. So brine disposal is oil man's headache, 1953. And this is out of Michigan. Um, and, and what is laid out here, and I highlighted this on the right, is, is exactly what we're seeing now happening next to injection wells or next to places where there's impoundments, these pits of oil field waste, oil field brine. Um, you know, they, they're basically saying, uh, we can just read some of it, all plans to control this have proved unsatisfactory. Groundwater in the vicinity of brine producing oil fields have become polluted and unfit for public use. Surface vegetation has been destroyed. There's property damage. We're dealing with lawsuits right now in Pennsylvania, just like this damage to fish life, uh, and several towns and industries became alarmed at possible permanent damage to their water supplies. You don't hear about this often, but there are still cities in Ohio, there are cities all over Oklahoma, um, they cannot use their groundwater because they were contaminated with oil field brine decades ago. Um, so the harms are there across the land. This is again why it's so nice to talk to a public health uh, oriented group, 
you know, there's a lot to find. Once you know where to look, there's a lot to learn and a lot of ways to hold accountable um, that just are invisible if you don't have the background. To give you an idea of how much brine, uh, again, this is this liquid oil-filled wastewater that's coming up at virtually every well, how much comes to the surface? So we have this great report um, from this Oklahoma-based group. It puts all the different brine produced in all the different wells together over a trillion gallons a year. And so here's um, kind of hokey image, but like it's the moon. What's the moon got to do with it? You can take all the brine that the U.S. produces in a single year, put it into your standard oil barrel, which is, you know, like waist high or something, so round, uh, stack those barrels together and you'd be able to reach the moon and back 22 times. That, that's the year's worth of oil filled waste from the U.S. It can actually go through space, stacked up, hit the moon, back, 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 back like that. And that's a year. So that's a lot of waste that the industry has to get rid of. <laughs> They have to do something about that. Um, they used to just spill the brine um, into right into creeks, right into rivers, right into marshes, put it in unlined pits right next to a well. That was a very cheap way to get rid of it. We have other ways now. They're still problematic. Um, focus for a moment on the radium. Again, you're bringing up this. Uh, you're bringing up this really interesting mix of elements from within the earth when you bring up oil and gas. Um, a lot of them are worrisome, toxic uh, compounds. We have things like volatile organics, which I'm, I'm sure some of the other folks in this webinar have spoken about. Um, that's like benzene, toluene. We, we know benzene to be a, a human carcinogen, but we also have heavy metals and we have radium, which is a radioactive heavy metal. And radium, unlike some of the other radioactive elements that are down deep down in Earth's formation, uh, radium tends to be moderately soluble. So that just means it will flow when you have this salty mix of brine down in the oil and gas formation. Radium, uh, some of it's going to remain in the rock, but some of it is going to mix in with that liquid waste stream. Uh, right now, it's just you know a brew of heavy metals and salts down in the oil and gas formation. And it's going to be pulled up to the surface when the oil and gas is extracted. And radium is actually going to come up with it. It's soluble, so it will actually mix in. Um, and blow up with the oil and gas with the oil field brine to the surface. And so all those trucks we saw just a couple of slides ago, these are filled with oil field brine, also with flowback, um, and they have radium. So how much radium? EPA has very specific definitions for radioactive waste. Um, EPA's definition, there's two different isotopes or forms of radium that are that are really prominent in oil field waste and oil field issues in general, that's radium-226, radium-228, and EPA's limit is 60 picocuries per liter for each of those isotopes or forms of radium in defining radioactive waste. Um, so th th this is an actual definition that exists as EPA is defining, they define various things in various parts of their rulemaking body, and we have this really important definition because it lets you know how much radium you need for EPA to be concerned. And uh, we also have a safe drinking water limit, which is uh, formed when you combine these two different radium isotopes together. So in this case, EPA is saying you can't have more than five picocuries per liter when you combine these two different isotopes of radium in any drinking water that people are going to be drinking, any public drinking water system. And you can just remember those numbers, five, when you combine them, 60 alone. And then we look at the Marcellus levels, and they're well beyond that. So you cannot say that this is of no concern because going back to, and these are health-based limits, by the way, going back to these limits, you see that the Marcellus brine flies high above them. And this is important. It isn't just like a one hot sample. This is from Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's own data. The average levels in the Marcellus are well above these limits. So the average radium-226 level would be defined as radioactive waste, same for the average radium-228. And you add them together, and you're, of course, miles above a drinking water limit. Um, so where does the brine go now? Um, you know, just think of that early slide from Michigan. It's being dumped into fields, creeks. Obviously, that's a problem. Unlined pits, of course, there's going to be contamination. What have we come up with? 96% of the brine now is going to injection wells. Now, here is a Google map image from Ohio. OK, we have an injection well. Silco Oil Field Services operates an injection well where radioactive oil field waste, by definition, we just went through it, can be considered radioactive oil field waste. It also has all sorts of other toxic compounds in it. Um, it is going to be injected on the edge of a shopping plaza. 
And so you can sit, and I've sat with oil field workers in the Taco Bell, you eat chalupa or whatever, drink your soda at Taco Bell, you can watch oil field waste be taken to this injection well. It's right next to the Verizon store. Uh, I've seen a truck driver after depositing oil field waste, go through the shopping plaza, park their car and go into Starbucks to get a coffee. Here, um, this is Barnesville, Ohio, truck filled with oil field waste going right through downtown. This happens, I sat there with uh, another great organizer involved with this, Jill Hunkler. She lives in this area and I sat on a bench, right? This is like the main crossroads in Barnesville. And I believe at that time it was like eight or nine trucks of waste a minute going through downtown. And there's a school just back that way. So again, to show you, um, this might be invisible. If you're out there and you don't know, and you're driving across America, you see this, it might just be a truck. There's, uh, there's a specific thing being hauled in that truck and it's copious. And once you open your eyes to it, you realize just how copious. And this is just to show the lack of regulation. I mean, they have set up a radioactive oil filled waste injection well on the edge of a shopping plaza and that is deemed appropriate. Um, but again, you have this massive stream of waste, you need to get rid of it. And that's the way the industry, uh, that's what we rely on now, injection wells. So at the bottom, I tried to paint with little, um, with little, um, with like highlights. And again, this is uh, Julie Dermansky's really epic photo again from, uh, um, forget which oil field out West, but you have these incredible tanks um, and you, have a lot of these might be containing oil, but many of them are also containing brine. If you look, if you go to a well site, you'll see tanks. Um, you might think, oh, they're all oil. Well, no, some of them, if you look closely, will say brine on them or produced water. And it remember, it's a really gunky liquid. It has a lot of suspended particles, suspended solid particles of metal. Metal is a solid, radium is a metal and it's a solid. So these things are gonna settle out. And if you have a tank of brine, you're gonna form a sludge on the bottom of the tank. And that sludge, is gonna have a really high radioactive signature, even higher than the brine. Because just think about it, if you think the radioactivity is in the radium, it's in the solids, and the solids are settling out and accumulating on the bottom, that stuff that accumulates on the bottom is gonna be the most concerning stuff. And the same thing in a truck, that truck going right through Barnesville. Um, and this is really extraordinary, but there are Department of Transportation radioactivity limits for trucks. I'll get into in a moment, we have an exemption that enables this truck to pass through downtown Barnesville as non-hazardous waste, even though it's quite hazardous. Um, but also we have uh, something completely potentially illegal happening here, which is we do have, there is enough radioactivity within that sludge. And this comes from someone who runs a, a oil field radioactivity consulting firm in Texas and a lot of research to get to this realization that sometimes the sludge, because of the sludge, it can be so radioactive that this truck actually would need a radioactivity placard um, but really ever do you see them with that? And again, going right through towns, but the sludge becomes really a huge problem for workers because they're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, and this is just to show, this is an important part of it, the economics. Again, you know, industry wants the oil and gas, still huge demand for that around the world. Uh, the waste is a problem. And, and you know, what does the, um, the, uh, the capitalist market economy do? It turns that into a product. So the waste is being, marketed, people can invest in oil field waste, investors can buy up injection wells, they can buy oil field waste landfills, and this is exactly what's happening. And here you have, you know, this, uh, I mean, the message is spelled out right here, this growing dirty water problem should create opportunities for investors through service companies which treat, recycle, or dispose of this dirty produced water. So I'll show you in a second, it seems all glossy here and like a great investment, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who really don't even know it and think they're cleaning up the industry by investing in something like this, but we'll get to just what that looks like on the ground, um, which is this. Um, so these companies come along and they wanna help this problem. They are aware that communities don't like injection wells. They're aware that there's this oil field waste problem. And so they try and set up what's called a treatment plant, an oil field waste treatment plant. When it's dealing with the liquid waste stream with the brine, often what they'll try and do is remove the salts. Brine also has quite a lot of salt, um, toxic levels of salts, huge amounts of salt. So if you wanna reuse the water for a fracking operation, say you're gonna try and remove the salt, but you also have all the suspended solids, including radium, including these heavy metals. So you set up these plants. This is uh, again, Sabrina Bedford's illustration of this plant that actually exists in Northern West Virginia. And it um, really illustrates it nicely, um, how nefarious it is, but you set up these facilities and they can have big money behind them. This plant was, uh, 
was created by a union between Antero Resources, a Colorado oil and gas extraction company, and Veolia, which is a very fancy multinational company based in Paris, France. Um, and they said they're going to treat fracking waste. They're going to do it really well. And um, they're going to create like one of the greatest environmental assets the oil and gas industry in the U.S. has ever seen. What happened is this, this plant was a failure. And there's now a lawsuit uh, where Antero is suing Veolia over the failure of this plant. But failure and even the lawsuit makes it seem, um, you know, the, it, it's very, um, it, it's a little bit clinical, right? What is really behind an oil field waste treatment plant failing? And that we learn about in the next story. Um, and this is, again, uh, some Ohio organizers and a fantastic scientist here, Dr. Yuri Gorby on the right, were sampling at another facility, similar to the Clearwater one. Uh, that was the name of that facility, Clearwater. This is a different facility, also in Northern West Virginia. And the difference there is we had access. So these facilities come up, all this gusto, we got investors, we're gonna treat oil field waste. And this is what it looks like a couple of years later. And what is so frightening here is we learned um, that the community was parting here. I mean, this is this weird industrial site. It's got all these corridors, there's beer cans everywhere, there's condoms, there's old mattresses. I mean, it's frightening what was happening at this place. And then we go there with a Geiger counter um, and the Geiger counter, actually, you set different limits on Geiger counters and Dr. Gorby's Geiger counter maxed out here, um, which um, to translate to a unit, it was around two milliroontions per hour, um, which is above uh, an OSHA, that's an OSHA workers limit on radioactivity. It's maxing out and it just looks kind of like soil. So you just imagine all the people who are moving around the site have no idea, but this is what was left. This is what is left behind and finally, now there actually is some action on this site and the EPA is, is moving towards remediation, which is fantastic, but um, workers are also reaching out to me now conveying, you know, what it was like to work there and exactly what they were exposed to. And, and that's worrisome. And, and here you see one quote, a really wonderful gentleman named Sean reaching out. I felt good about the job, thought we were doing something beneficial for the environment. And that's the thing, uh, workers are duped in the same way communities are when these facilities come in and, and many workers now I've spoken to across the spectrum who work at these treatment facilities and, and they are proud of their job because they really feel like they're cleaning up the industry. We need oil and gas and this is a facility that helps make it cleaner. What they have really done is contaminate themselves with a variety of things, including radioactivity. Two of Sean's coworkers have passed away from cancer, one of stomach cancer and one of brain cancer. And Sean has experienced all sorts of health issues and there, you know, we're starting to put together pieces. We can eventually make links with enough data, but they worked. If you see this main building on the left there, um, and then there's a another building lower down, which is, has a similar look. These buildings, when you get inside, they're moving around this waste. It's incredibly dusty. And then they're removing the salt, which creates this, this really kind of toxic salt dust. And they are breathing all this in, all this in, no respirators, no PPE, sludge covering their clothing often goes home and washed in the family washing machine. So these are exposures that um, we will be able to actually put together numbers because people of course appropriately will say, well, how do you know the worker's cancer came from their oil field work? Um, well, you know what, now because we've had access because the industry is so incredibly sloppy, you've been able to actually go and look through their garbage, know how radioactive it is, and then I connected Sean to uh, Dr. Dan Bain, a scientist at Pitt, who can go what's th uh, put together what's called the dosage model, put together um, a picture of exactly how long Sean worked there, how many hours a day, how many times he, um, you know, how many breaths he took over the course of the day. Did he eat lunch in the workplace environment or not? Which, by the way, I just learned from uh, from. Um, the wife, actually, of, of a worker who passed away, um, that they had cookouts in this parking lot. So yes, they ate there. These all add to what a worker's exposures, and we will be able to put together a picture that eventually can give us a good scientific estimate of whether or not these cancers came from their radioactivity. Um, and this is these are just other pictures. This is and these are pictures were taken, by the way, by the Ohio. In this case, the Ohio State Regulatory Agency. So I, I mean, like what? What other operation can you come and have it look like this? Um, and there's a photo I didn't put in here, but there's a worker with uh, with uh, what looks like a push broom and a t-shirt. Um, so um, the level of care is really um, is really um, 
it's not significant. It, it's paltry, and that means concerns for the workers. And I won't, um, I'm just going to go a little bit more because I imagine there, there's good questions at this point. But, but again, you, the central problem, the central problem the industry faces is how to get rid of the waste. And this is kind of an age old trick. You turn it into something beneficial because then it has even less regulations. Then we can sell it and make money, and then it's a good thing, right? So this has happened. Um, this is not fracking waste. This is from conventional oil and gas. Um, and uh, conventional oil and gas brings up oil field brine too. Even if you have a dry well where um, it stops flowing oil or gas, it, it often can still bring up brine. And in this case, it has been uh, put through some sort of treatment process. I don't know all the details of that because the company hasn't necessarily conveyed them. But what we do know is the state of Ohio has tested this product, which has been sold on the shelves of hardware stores in northern Ohio and found that it has, again, radium levels. Um, you can see it there in point two, well above these limits that EPA has set. And so, um, you know, what, there's many ways to try and convey, well, how much radium? I give the number right there. But um, the nuclear industry would not be able to discharge this into the environment. This product would have so much radium that if it were coming out of one of their pipes, they, they would not be able to discharge. It is too much radium, but yet it's oil and gas. It can be sold as a product on the shelves of stores. Um, so we, we have you know glaring inconsistencies in our rule of law. Of course, it's the same radium. Um, and so that was frightening. Um, a lot of exemptions. This is a really, really important one. <clears throat> Excuse me, because it's often overlooked. We have this really uh, interesting law in the US Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Um, there's the little uh, symbol up there. It was made really to try and um, solve the United States' industrial waste problem. And so one way of trying to work with that is we're, we, we need to figure out how better to deal with hazardous industrial waste. To do that, we need to know what exactly is hazardous and what isn't. So we kind of look through all the different industries and the EPA had to determine what is hazardous, what is considered non-hazardous. Hazardous waste will get treated in a different way, um, still often not appropriately, uh, but the labels are important. And industry, oil and gas industry got this incredible exemption where even though their waste has many different uh, contaminants that would indicate it would be hazardous, especially certain aspects of the waste, like the sludge, um, like other mineral scales that can build up in pipelines, um, but yet they got a label of non-hazardous. Um, and the language behind EPA's conclusion, which finally came in 1988, is pretty remarkable and revealing. But essentially, one of the reasons they're saying is if we label that hazardous, we just would have too much waste, uh, and it would cause a severe economic impact on the industry, and it would cause a permitting burden. Um, we wouldn't have enough facilities to deal with it, it would hinder the development of new oil and gas. So, I mean, I really, and this is like an important message, you don't have to say, you know, close the drills. You don't have to say, fire all the workers. All you really have to say is do this actually scientifically appropriate and the industry overnight would not be able to operate because they've been given so many free passes, so many exemptions that they have created a system that relies on just utterly sloppy operating schemes that enable pictures like the previous one to happen. Um, they, of course, would argue that with a lot of gloss and attorneys. OK, again, wow. So of course, I'm going to all the different regulatory agencies across the country, asking them questions. And, and I'm sure uh, PSR experiences this as well. You, feel, you get to feel like you're living in the twilight zone. I know people in oil and gas communities next to infrastructure feel like this because it's like, I'm seeing the harms, I'm worried, I'm reading, I'm, I'm learning what I think is science. And then I run it by the regulators and you get these kind of odd runaround answers that basically says they're not paying attention to any of this. And, and these are really the responses. Um, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is telling me um, we don't regulate or license this material. Um, the EPA is telling me there's no federal agency that regulates the radioactivity brought to the surface by oil and gas. Great. It's a complete black hole. The Department of Transportation, and here's why the exemption is so key, many reasons, but you can see them saying, um, we don't consider Brian a hazardous material. So great. We don't have to follow that one. Um, OSHA says there's potential, uh, little potential for harm. I mean, I would love to tour OSHA around as I've gone around with groups like PUSR and, and show them what these workers are actually facing, but those relationships, unfortunately, haven't been able to develop. 
um, and NIOSH as well, uh, part of the CDC, which has done some really great work. That's the National Institute for Occupational Safety and, and Health. They have done some very good work focusing on other oil field harms, but on this issue, um, they're really not tuned in. Um, one more item connected to this exemption, you know, your mind is kind of continuously um, blown on this topic, but because oil field waste is considered non-hazardous, it can be legally imported from other countries, even if it's radioactive. Remember, the radioactivity part gets buried under the non-hazardous label, so it can be imported from other countries' oil fields into the U.S., um, and there's a, this is a legal site, although what's happening here, I don't personally believe that is legal, although I've run this by the regulators, they seem to have no problem with it, but this is a site in West Texas. They actually have permits to inject oil field waste into what's called a salt cavern. It would be about as an appropriate place as you can find for dealing with some of the industry's worst waste. If you, um, if you do what's called solution mining, you can, you can remove the salt and you, you have as close as we can get to like a giant store, storage locker underground. And so I learned that this facility, which is called Lotus, it's in the West Texas desert in Andrews, Texas. They had asked EPA, they did their homework. They followed this the right way. They asked the Texas regulators, can we import radioactive oil for waste from other countries? And the regulators thought about it, looked through their notes and said, yes, because of this exemption, you can do that. And what I learned in reporting on it and different whistleblowers and people coming forward, um, and also just looking through the regulators' own records all point to this, uh, to this problem, which is that at least at times, this facility has not been able to appropriately put the waste down beneath the earth, and thus it ends up piling on the surface in the way you see here. And this um, photo should be uh, photo credited to Justin Hamill. I apologize for not doing that, but Justin was able to fly over in a small plane and capture this because it's very hard to get to these, you know, dusty Texas facilities. Um, and later, you know, lawsuits were threatened over this photo. Justin is a professional at this, photographs immigration issues along the border, followed all the appropriate rules of how close he could get. And of course, you know, the company was worried because the photo is massively damaging. I mean, it shows uh, what, you know, the records and the regulators, um, you know, details show too, which is, is that it appears that not all this waste is making it underground and you have it just sitting there in the Texas desert. And the fact that it came, um, seamlessly across our borders from other oil fields is, is just astonishing. I think really shows you um, some of the gaps in our policy on this issue. And I think um, this is really good reporting from Public Herald highlighting um, issues with landfills and how those play into the picture. Um, but I'm feeling, I know it's a lot of material. I can dive back into the PowerPoint and maybe if there's need or desire, go to, go to a second part, but I wanna pause it because um, I'm sure there's really good questions that have come up at this point. So I'm just going to take a break. And thank you all so much for tuning in. Thanks, Justin. That was so interesting. Um, it's always interesting. I feel like we could um, probably all keep listening, but there are um, some questions. I know like we, ha we already had some questions in mind. Um, uh, but let's see what the audience is asking. Um, they're just like about slides. Um, so it doesn't seem like there's a lot of questions in the audience. Um, Chris or Laura, do you have a question before I um, ask mine? Yeah, I do. Um, and it was really back in the beginning. I didn't want to interrupt, but like you, you, you did this thing about the Achilles heel, that article. It's that they knew the Achilles heel, which is something as a watchdog that I'm always looking for to, to, you know, it's a system and you want to take their Achilles heel out. Interestingly enough, we're sitting here fighting something, looking for Achilles heel. That's always been there. So I want to know, like, is that serious? Like that article is saying that this Achilles heel has been known for a while. And, and why did they call it an Achilles heel at the time? Yeah, no, good question. So I think it was me and there's other, um, uh, Ted, Alk with Frack Track Reliance it uses this a lot, and it's a great analogy. I mean, it is a weakness. Um, they, I think their words they use were oil man's headache. Um, <laughs> but um, but yes, they knew. I mean, they a headache, Achilles heel, an issue that they can't really find a good solution for. So they have known, and they have known that brine causes damage. They didn't necessarily focus on radioactivity then. They focused on, on just the pure salt, the high salt levels of brine. Um, which can be destructive. 
Um, again, this is um, this is biblical, right? You salt someone's land, you destroy it. There's still land across North Dakota that's unfarmable because of brine spills from the 50s. Um, and they focused also sometimes on heavy metals. Um, but yeah, that it, it's always been a problem. And, and if you just think about like the system of it, it's just, you know, it's not um, necessarily an unsolvable problem, but it's a problem that would cost a lot of time and money. And if you can just deal with it as cheaply as possible, you're going to. That's what our system enables and allows. And so that's what they've been following. That's why I asked you, because, I mean, we've been looking for an Achilles heel that's already there. And it was determined by the research that they've hidden. So it's like, how do they they hide these Achilles heels? It's obviously been determined by the industry or by them themselves, but not necessarily to people like us, like waking up in this, right? Like if I would have known that, I would have gone right after. I would have jumped on the Achilles heel that's already in existence. But this has been there for a while. And that's funny because it seems they cover up those Achilles heels and they're existing. Like we fight and try to take down these massive corporations, these massive systems. And now it's interesting to me that you said that because looking at it, it's about like how the cost factor, this is already a problem. It's a problem inherently because they don't understand their cradle to grave. Like they don't even abide by that. And so like that, obviously the cradle of grave to me seems like its own Achilles heel. Like, because the fact that they have a loophole shows they have no idea how to deal with it. Am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. No, you said there's a lot of things to say there. I mean, one is, yeah, the yeah. book is just filled with Achilles heels. I can't so. wait. <laughs> uh, I've got it. Heels. But, you know, a loophole just allows you to not have to solve the problem. That's what it really does. The and what can, you know they yeah, have yeah. primacy right well it, it allows you it allows an industry which does have money a lot of money to to be cheap because they don't have to address the real science of the issue mm -hmm. and, and where i really bring this very quickly in the book is okay you want to call it non-hazardous waste i get it it would magnify costs and we don't even know how much because we don't you know, know all the harms. The book tries to lay out all the harms. And I would love a group, it would take a, a good bit of math, but calculate what the cost increase would be. The industry at one point calculated it would be $10 billion a year. And that was in 1979. And they said an initial cost of like 30 billion. It would be much more than that to truly deal with this in a correct way. But take your non-hazardous waste and, and now you're going to spread it on the face of a worker. They do get splattered with sludge. You're going to have a worker breathe it in. And I want to ask the politicians, I mean, is it still non-hazardous? Do you think it's still non-hazardous as they're breathing it in? Is it still non-hazardous on their clothes that are washed in the washing machine? Right. And then goes into the family. Hey, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, I'm good. <laughs> Justin, you always have awesome answers. <laughs> yeah, I was so interested in the, um, that site where they were taking in waste from other countries. Um, so I was struck like we we don't label it hazardous material here, but doesn't it come in labeled hazardous material from other countries? Or do they also somehow get away with not labeling it? And actually, like I'd like to hear a little bit more if you can elaborate on you know what what you know about other countries and how they're handling it. Um, you know, not just not just labeling it hazardous material, but like how are they even dealing like the state, the countries that extract, how do they deal with their waste? And, you know, um, how is OSHA like, um, you know, on a, a, a global level, um, how are the workers being protected, if at all? No, super, Tammy. And I'm looking at, there's really great comments in the chat too. So answering you, but also addressing some of that. I mean, first I want to say like, um, I know the information can seem like like a downer and, and just lead to despair because it's like, oh no, another problem. But really, I think talking about the Achilles heel, and I saw another journalist point out that, you know, they've been given that uh, language as well. You, you're really learning a toolkit with this topic. And the toolkit is a way to hold the industry accountable on an issue that they have not yet been held fully accountable on. Uh, and, and that is a way to bring a lot of um, you know, a really a lot of needed support to workers, to communities in oil and gas countries, and massive changes eventually to the culture of extraction. So it's it shouldn't just be like, oh, another thing I have to worry about, I'm feeling down. I know that's, I mean, I go there too sometimes, 
But it's really like you learn this valuable kernel, many kernels of knowledge, and that can be taken forward in a very powerful way. Other countries, um, sometimes some parts of it are better. Um, but I'll tell you right now, I'm working on a story uh, that I've been working on for some time uh, from the North Sea. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to spend some time in North Sea oil field countries, Netherlands and the UK. And, you know, we often, I know Amsterdam, you know, cool place that often is painted as like the fountain of sustainability. I mean, Amsterdam harbors Shell and Shell has, you know, been extracting oil and gas in an aggressive way for a very long time on this earth. So is BP, which is out of the UK. So the North Sea is one of these early iconic oil fields. Uh, how do they deal with their brine? Uh, they discharge much of it right into the North Sea. And this is <laughs> our working on with other journalists as well. Um, across North Sea oil and gas countries. And there's like, a, it took a lot of knowledge to be able to get to that point and then understand that and then, you know, peek behind various lids and paint that up. But that will be coming out sometime later this spring, hopefully, um, across different platforms in the US, but also Northern European countries. So not good. But that's also why, again, we can, you know, flip the script and say that, you know, this can be turned into positive. I mean, this is knowledge that other healthcare groups can use in other countries, other um, journalists can use in other countries. And I know there's a journalist on here who's reported on fracking waste in Argentina, an incredible report. This is Nick Cunningham's report, which is published with the SMOG uh, about the way they deal with the fracking waste in Argentina. And it's astonishing, it's horrible. Much of it is happening on indigenous land and it's sloppy. So, and, and if you're just covering this industry new, you just see a lot of trucks and you see a lot of different things that look like soil moving around and, it, and it's easy to miss. And a resident in an area would see that too. And often a worker is told it's just soil. It's really like deep um, reading, research and learning, but journalists can hopefully make it a little easier by making it palatable and presenting it back to people. And eventually you can paint in the lines of what's in that, what's in that pile of dirt, what's in that truck, what is this new facility that wants to come in? Whether it's in Argentina, whether it's in South Africa, where there's a lot of fracking, um, whether it's in you know offshore UK or right here in the US. Um, yeah. Doesn't sound like um, they're doing too much better than us. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, Justin, and, and I find it interesting when you say the North Sea, because it's like a big wide open ocean that's uh, just spilling some more salt into the sea <laughs> like when you're talking about how to prove it like the dispersing like i feel like we've all seen this pattern after how many years of extraction history that we've had that they typically love going into those places but what we've we're now seeing is the boldness and the like like in my community as a bubbled suburbia community and tammy like we're called nimby all the time but nimby is very very important in this movement to understand not in my backyard but i mean it is it's here and um also that's how bold they are now they're literally okay with that and so the fact that this is this has been going on in these rural areas and these you know indigenous lands for so long because there hasn't been like much attention paid now it's going there they're they're so bold that they're they're coming right out with it almost to the point where like yeah we are we have a loophole and so you know, it's 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 scary to me in Pennsylvania, especially that we're looking at people who literally have conflict of interest and are have many wells on their lands. And that's somebody that we continually elect to represent the people like there's a, 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 a an extraction like addiction or a misunderstanding, which I feel like when you ask Tammy, like, what do international companies they've been probably dealing with it much longer than us. And, you know, it's just that we're seeing it now and we're, you know, we're basically whatever happened in our country. We're the ones that are uh, a lot of people around us are fighting hard and doing some great things. But we're as Pennsylvania and Texas example, we're basically the ones that are just sucking it out of and um, making plans for the future of everybody for like it, it seems very. Like, how do we get here? Um, I kind of think we haven't ne really necessarily understood our true history. <laughs> like that's where I'm at. So I'm not surprised that they did that in the sea, but I'm 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 also surprised as a, as somebody living in in this area that 
all of a sudden people are surprised that there's a pipeline coming through this area and it's a really dangerous one. And, but hold on, there's been 20, Justin, you've been here. We have the most pipelines. If you look in Pennsylvania, we have one of the most populous, and <laughs> we have the most pipelines. Historically, legacy, where was that ever in people's minds? Like that this was ever, it's weird. Yeah. So, I mean, could you, <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I toured you and I'm like, this is weird. Um, no, I appreciate it. And I'm looking, um, um, please, uh, Justice is wonderful. And <laughs> people confuse my name or call me Justine. That's even better. Um, really, I did not call you. It was my typo. Sorry. But that's great. That's fine. Call you are Justice. Um, but no, another really good comment about, um, about, you know, this idea, and I think this is something PSR is working on, of, of making healthcare workers aware of, um, of certain symptoms. So a worker comes in, and when they say, uh, I haul sludge for the oil field, uh, and I have these certain symptoms, I'm having breathing troubles, I'm, you know, that, that I, I have um, weird things with my teeth, their teeth are falling out, that a healthcare provider knows uh, to ask certain questions and, and kind of knows to take that in a certain way. Um, th these are really valuable things. And this is like, I mean, so you say, you can say, you know, um, you can hold your, you can be critical of, of what's happening um, in Pennsylvania, PK, but I'm really, I think Pennsylvania has actually done an incredible job of, of organizing and bringing awareness on issues. Um, you have a really strong network of knowledge that is building st stronger. Um, many states, oil and gas states, for example, Oklahoma, I mean, that they don't have that. They don't have this group. And these are such important things because when the healthcare providers know what to look out for for the oil food workers, you know, I think suddenly light bulbs are going to start to click on very quickly. And we can actually see how many people have been affected right now by this. Right now, it's only when a worker speaks out and it takes a lot of courage for them to do that. And they have to kind of read a horrible article and realize they work there and maybe they'll call me. But there's many more workers for each one who speaks out that have health concerns. Um, and as you build awareness in the health community, I think, mm. you know, she will become even clearer of what's happening. Um, are, uh... Yeah, J I was just gonna say, yeah, there is, I mean, just speaking as like a healthcare provider, there's like no education for us on, on these issues. Um, I mean, there's very little education on like the occupational health side, but I, I was going to ask you, Justin, because it seems like, you know, I mean, I think it's amazing that you're going to be able to get this direct link like to these workers cancer and that say that this came from their job. I mean, I, that is just like a really important step, but it's all like, these are people who came to you, right? Or you found, this is not like, there's nowhere for us you know, if somebody's like in the UPMC health system, we can access that data in terms of like looking at studies, like you can see all these numbers, but it's like the, it's so hard to get the health info on these um, oil workers, right? Like it's sort of like, do they have their own, um, you know, physicians that they see? Is that information kept really tight or they're not even educated on their own health impacts? So um, I just didn't know if you had any other thoughts on like how we can get um, more information from them other than just hoping that they they speak out themselves. It's a great question, Laura. And what I have found is that talking about it um, and writing stories about it is the best way to kind of shake out courageous whistleblowers and give them really the opportunity to tell their story. Um, so I, right after the Rolling Stone article, which is one of the first big publications I did on this issue in 2020, right after it came out, I went uh, back to Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Northern West Virginia, did a bunch of talks at local universities, often with like a local scientist or with, um, Sil Kajiano, who's a fire chief in Ohio working on these issues. And at every single one, workers were there and came out with, you know, good questions and stories. So I think having events actually in communities is a really um, is a really powerful and important way to give people the chance. I mean, it's like once you give them the right chance, the stories spill out. But if they have no chance, um, it's going to stay contained. And yeah, when there's good when there's a good story on a specific place where a worker has worked, that's another way because that gets passed around in the worker community. 
and you know that I see that falls to my sector in journalism. You know, I want to be able to engage other journalists to write about this. The more these facilities are, are you know, put into word and put into the public sphere, the more the people who work there are going to be coming out, and, and you build from there. Yeah, so just create opportunities across the board, different types of you know opportunities. Makes a lot of sense. Chris, do you have your hand up? I do, um, but I, not really though. It was supposed to go lowered, but I'm, I, I do now after what you said. Um, so in Pennsylvania, I just went through an interesting thing, Justin, dealing with a uh, landfill in Lackawanna County. Um, not just that, like people, when they figure out we were putting sensors up kind of like it just happened that people were like oh my god like this landfill the census people care we want to like collect data on our own it's kind of empowering um but through that we found some interesting people who had this random um i was fo i'm obviously focused on oil and gas but there was this like issue that came up about a, a, a weird smelting plant but it used to be a light bulb plant and these people have been living in this community for 20 years and just been dealing with it and the guy called us because he was concerned about how the workers were being harmed in it and obviously this dude was a uh, he's seven years old and is a construction worker and has been aware of it but he like lives across from it now and is seeing like that the DEP, I don't know if they're paid off or whatever, but like the emissions coming out. So it's this common thing where the workers and he being a worker in the past has seen what he's doing. But he's like, I'm supposed to be retired and like breathing easy now. Now I'm sitting across from this place where I can't breathe. And I'm also watching these workers being harmed. And it's like, it seems more like beyond oil and gas. It's li literally like, wh where was the DEP and the DOH, the, our, our regulatory agencies and this community basically said, oh, they're all paid off. And that's like where they went and complained. They had no, you know, ability to help. So like it's be beyond oil and gas. It seems more like a behavioral issue about like people taking like a complaint from a person, a health and impact, and, and it goes nowhere. Like, especially when they're going to the DEP, right, who has no purview in health and they're supposed to go to DOH. It's It seems like a dead end for people who don't know what we do. Like, we're crazy. We know what to do. We know how to go and what to push on. But like, that's why we're going and educating people. It's a lot to ask too, so. No, I'm thinking of what you're saying. I saw a really good earlier comment, but it's like every moment with this, no matter what field you're in, is a mo mm -hmm. is a chance either to kind of cower away and fall in line and let a harm happen or mm -hmm. act courageously to try and tell what's really happening. And someone put a great comment in about chemistry, like we have failed. <clears throat> And so this is, there's an incredible example with Dr. Marco Kautofen, <clears throat> excuse me, the nuclear forensic scientist I quoted early on. Marco was working in a world, I believe it was in the late eighties and was realizing that all of the labs that test for chemicals, they're also testing for big companies, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that was a major problem because he was trying to point out contamination across um, the world really so Marco founded his own environmental analysis lab so he could do the work himself. And like, mm. and that's an example. You you have this chance to be like, well, I'll just go with the system. Or you know what? I'm gonna, as a worker told me, I love this analogy. I'm gonna jack the e-brake, take a look around, and then I'm just gonna build my own system. And you know, you you can do that. That's there in journalism, it's there in chemistry, it's there in healthcare. And it really just means, you know, like, am I gonna kind of accept this or am I going to figure out a way to really understand it and it might mean like kind of going solo and taking a lot of risk but <laughs> that's what I love going. how you said Jack that's perfect that definitely sounds like a, yeah a worker thank you Justin so um this has been a fun conversation um i think there's questions there's it looks like there's like five questions i have not been paying attention to the chat so i'm not sure if anything jumps out from there but um Tinye, um if you don't mind would you read out some of the questions please sure thank you first question is from barbara brandon is the Krupa on the slide a relative of Grim Krupa, who is the PA state representative from Fayette, Fayette County? She started a HB to prohibit injection of fracking waste water into wells in Pennsylvania. Yeah. 
if anyone knows the answer to that. If it's Barbara, I know she did her research. <laughs> Jeez, oh man. Yeah, That's a is, question. Is, the, is Krupa related to, um, I'm not sure. It is a good question. I don't um, know. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Barbara, we'll get back to you, definitely. <laughs> yes. Has there been research on the long-term impact of radioactive oil field waste on ecosystems? Once we stop the accumulation of waste, what remediation will have to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is, um, there's amazing science that's been done and it often doesn't you know, hit the news and fully hit the public sphere. But in Pennsylvania, there's been fantastic research and also in North Dakota. So I'll just give two quick examples that speak directly to that question. In North Dakota, researchers with the US Geological Survey looked at a brine spill and they tracked it through a creek that moves through the North Dakota environment. And they looked like three miles downstream from the spill site and then like four and a half miles downstream. They found contaminants, including the radioactive element radium had built up at uh, in a floodplain that was like three miles downstream from the spill site. And they put very strong language as to what that means. And, the, and it built up in high in levels high enough to make it um, you know, past certain EPA limits on radium controls in soil. So it built up to a concerning extent and it built up to an extent where there'd be expected eventually biological effects in the environment. Um, and and that was like an, a, a really a powerful study where you, the real revelation there is when brine spills in a large amount, it is going to move through the environment and it's going to accumulate somewhere else. And this is going back to uh, PK was talking about this, you know, and this is what they tell me in many places. Well, the river is big enough that it's going to dilute it. And again, we go back to Marco with an amazing quote, wherever there is a dilution effect happening in nature, somewhere else there is a concentration effect. So we here we have radium from a brine spill building up on a floodplain three miles downstream. Um, the oil field waste has moved through the environment, been taken through it, and then it's been deposited and accumulated somewhere else. Other studies in Pennsylvania, they found contaminants from oil field waste building up in freshwater mussels. Um, this mm. is recently happening, yeah, with uh, that's Nat Warner's lab at Penn State. Um, and other good groups at Penn State, together with researchers at Duke University, um, have looked, uh, they've looked in the sediment right next to oil field waste treatment plants where they're discharging. They found that indeed radioactivity is building up at those points of discharge. And they've even looked in reservoirs many miles downstream from the discharge points and found that they can find the signature of oil field waste in the mud at the bottom of the reservoir. So radioactivity is moving through the environment. It's often a question of how and where to look, but there's there are some great scientists who are, who are tracking that now. Um, and I think, you know, what, um, I mean, there's great things like the compendium, the compendium of health harms on unconventional oil and gas drilling, which, you know, kind of collects that research every year. And these are really valuable tools to, for people to pay attention to that research, because there's a lot of it. Um, but we are learning that picture. And, and, you know, that's a great question. I mean, and we need more people doing that work. And so some of these labs, by the way, are like really, you know, hot labs of research. I mean, graduate students are coming in, going to these people, they then set up their own labs. So if you're looking to get into the world of science, this is kind of like an incredible new territory of, um, you know, of science that's really fascinating. And it's only gonna grow as we try and figure out just what's happening, what has happened. Thank you. We have two more questions in Q&A. The first is, why do you think this issue hasn't taken hold in the public consciousness the way fear, wariness around nuclear facilities has? Right. It's, yeah, it's um, China syndrome movie yet. I mean, it's, um, there's, it's a very important question. Um, it's, um, and I'm referring to that movie where um, I forgot which famous actor is in it, but but you know they like kind of walk through a nuclear meltdown, um, and uh, and that I think has a certain power that image um, that this just sometimes just seems like piles of dirt and why does that bother me? So imagery and story is important, um, 
And, and if it's not, you know, literally a nuclear bomb going off, it's sometimes hard for people to visualize a harm, especially in a world where there's many, many concerning issues happening. Um, and, and all that complexity goes, it might, you, you know, that might seem unimportant, but that becomes really important because all that complexity around this issue goes to eventually like people just tune out and then they tune into something else and they move on and it doesn't go forward. Um, as I just told, again, I just told this filmmaker, this issue was on the cover of the New York Times in the 1990s. And it was a good article with really good quotes about oil field radioactivity, contamination across the country. Um, there was ramifications after that article, but clearly it didn't fully stick because here we are today. So, you know, I it ends up being a question back to ourselves, you know, what um, is wrong with, with our world if we can't, you know, move forward on an issue like this. And, and we're all trying and there's other things in the way. But, um, you know, one thing I can do and you all can do and, you know, I try and do as a storyteller uh, is I want to and I now have the opportunity because a book is a bigger chance than a magazine article. I, I'm trying to present this back in a way, Tanya, where people cannot ignore it, where they just can't put it down anymore, where it's so important and relevant, whether they're in New York City, because this issue ends up in New York City, whether people know it or not right now, or in the Bakken of North Dakota on the Fort Worth Indian Reservation, um, they cannot ignore this issue. And, and you know, that's, that's my goal here with this project. That's amazing. Um, I think some of the... Um, mm -hmm. Some of the other reasons like people are quiet about it is because there's such a hush in communities. And that was like one of the first things I was told when I came into this field is like the first thing they fracture is the community. Mm -hmm. And there's a division made between the workers and environmentalists as if we're enemies. Um, and, um, you know, this, this other idea that the reason that we were fracking um, you know, thanks to like beautiful companies like Halliburton were like, it was a good thing to frack because then we wouldn't be reliant on um, importing energy sources. Um, so that was a huge article. So people supported it feeling like patriotic and then supporting it because they want their community back to work and thriving. And like, these are good things. We're supposed to want to, you know, rely on ourselves, be self-reliant, and we're supposed to want to support our community and be thriving communities. Um, but there's such lies about it. I mean, it's so wild how how many wars there are over it um, and how like driving force of the war is the is the gas um, and is the oil. So like it's it's just a complete lie. And like, but we're not seeing like so many things that happen with us, like we're not seeing it on our on our territory as much as as we're seeing it in other places where people are literally dying over it. Mm -hmm. um like in a war sense mm -hmm. but then here we have these slower things and the, and the people that we're supposed to be doing it for the workers supporting them supporting this idea of a thriving community it's literally killing them but it's slower and i feel like those myths like sunk in to a certain Slow degree bodies. and and in the like eight years that i've been doing this um, yeah, it's a very slow violence but in the eight years that i've been doing that i feel like the conversation has changed dramatically there, when I first started, you could barely even speak to some people about it. And it was jobs, 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 economy, economy. And, and the more, you know, is published, you know, the, as the compendium shows, the studies just keep coming out and coming out and coming out. And there's people like you who are finding out what's going on inside about the, the radiation. And the conversation is changing. It, it, I feel like it's been slow, but it really is changing. I don't know if you're seeing that kind of change in like the headlines and the, the comfortability of people being able to talk about it with one another with their within their communities and stuff like that uh, yeah 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 Laura come on that's the I just, work you got I you just didn't want to interrupt Justin he had a right? response on, I was too. we were talking about this some on uh the webinar uh we had earlier today but just like this weird like normalizing of health in like health symptoms and cancer in general. Um, and as well as like, you know, I, I don't know if you could see this or like predict this, Justin, but just like, you know, there are things like um, like mercury and fish that like, you know, you just accept that there's going to be so much in the environment that you just say, okay, well, this is a health acceptive level, even if there's like actually no science behind it. It's just because that's, we, you wouldn't have any fish that didn't have um mm -hmm. Like that would be, you would be allowed to eat if you didn't just say that some amount was fine. You know what I mean? So 
Um, I just wonder if that's like happening too in some level with like radiation as people are like, oh, well, it's in the environment. And so there's just, we just have to accept that exposure to this is fine, even though there's not actually um, health reasons to say that other, we just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of those levels are set at, um, in some cases, like with OSHA, it's like set to, and even the nuclear regulatory commission, it's for the workers. Occupational in, health. Right. Eight protective hours day, gear, 40 hours eight hours, it's rules. Are strict. It's nothing like Good what question. we're seeing, Laura, like on the ground, you know, yeah. like and, and, 24 and you guys, hours a day. You guys have to take a little bit of credit. And Justin was trying to like, you know, kind of like set me straight a little bit earlier about PK, like the stuff in the, Pennsylvania has done. It. It's been a lot of the work that people like, uh, you know, y'all have been doing for years. I just came into PSR, but you guys pushed it. And now you're seeing like kind of, it's a slow process to see the results of like the work you've done to see something change and like start to, we call it the fossil fuel playbook. A lot of times like that language that we are always and it's interesting because you're kind of changing that you're taking that and be like, no, we know they have a playbook, but it's actually a colonist playbook when you look at it in a bigger scale. I, I was just so ignorant thinking fossil fuels because I'm fit, but this has been a pattern of behavior that we're seeing. And so like people like Tammy, you've always said it, we have to change the language. You have to change the mental. We have to change the, the conversation in these situations to like, we can't fight some things, but what we can do is relate to everybody and what they're, what, what is like, uh, again, going back to the yesterday with me with uh, Miguel, it was like yeah. self-interest organ organizing is very yeah. important. Yeah. He's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it is brilliant. And so I feel like this is all tying in. And Justin, you have literally been doing the work on the ground, like getting those so stories. Many people. Yeah. And yeah, there's so yeah, many and, people that yeah. talk. Like there's so many organized well, communities. Just I just had on like the back to everybody. <laughs> For real, like it takes such a collective effort, you know, like Justin can't by himself just enter a facility and, and think that it's going to go well. And, yeah. and these you know, crazy people like us or and work, like <laughs> people who speak out. I mean, I see he's serious. Like it's, it's very important to have people like I'm learning that. Like, it's hard to do this work that I do. And I feel like sometimes it's, it's not heard, but I'm here tonight. I freaked out the other couple, like last couple of days. So I'm like, I'm still here and nothing's changed. Then I'm talking to Justin and I remembered Justin actually helped me. Like you actually put my voice out there. And I was like, oh my God, somebody actually cared about what I was saying. And you took it seriously because you've actually been there and you understand how important it is. All these parts to play like into system. We're fighting a toxic system. We have to have a really strong system of communication, of networking, like we have to become the system that we want. We don't let this system be what, what we live in anymore. We're changing it. So I appreciate that. This has been a good, yeah. Justin. <laughs> yeah, just to go quickly what you were saying, Laura, about acceptance of harms. I think that's really important it, and it again goes back to this like idea of when do i and every individual has this option like do i when yes there's harms we're going to accept living in the world and then we make these trade-offs daily but like when do i speak out against them um but that's how the change happens i'm just thinking when you're talking it reminded me of the the group that's just sprung up now mad facts this group yeah. in Pennsylvania, composed of people who actually have lost their loved ones to cancer and they're not going to just take the state's data anymore they are actually actively trying to figure out themselves how many cancers there really have been connected to oil and gas or at least in oil and gas country and, and trying to you know ask these questions going through other networks going through the schools and and like that's you know that's it you know at some point and, and then so much can be learned when you get a movement like that I don't know, but acceptance of harms is something I think, I don't know, Laura, you're kind of a great writer, but like, that just seems like some, an interesting topic. There's so many, you know, that, that really resonates for some reason out of this. It's probably something we should dive into more at a, yeah. another time, but yeah, Matt, I just wanted to say like Mad Facts is, yeah, they're a great oh, group. Yeah. Um, I think they're doing good work and mm -hmm. they make a lot of changes, but. Very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that power comes from, you know, the most impacted people always like, that's what you see is like the people that have, they have already lost so much and they want to know like what caused it. And they want to know how they can prevent other people from having to deal with what they dealt with. Right. And you can't like, if it's, if it's your, your own family member that was lost, like you can't, you can kind of read through a lot of 
um, falseness. And you can, like, you won't stop. The drive is never going to stop. This is your loved one that you're talking about. That drive is going to keep going. And that's, you know, it makes it such an amazing, powerful network. And that's what we're seeing across, you know, like at now that we're forming like better relationships with people in the Gulf South and all these other places, it's that, it's that self-interested um, organizing as Miguel pointed out the other, on the mm-hmm. webinar the other day. And it's, it's very, it's, to me, it's, it's social movements. They're, they're the most powerful way to change things. And I feel yeah. like Justin's, um, go. <laughs> Justin, the way you're, um, the way you operate, which is why I brought up, like when we met, is that I could just see like almost anybody at any level just being comfortable talking to you because yeah. you're so comfortable with it. Like you're so, mm-hmm. you're so genuinely invested in this issue. And like you're, you ask questions with integrity and you really, really want to know the truth. Yeah. And that I think just makes people want to share it, <laughs> you know, especially in a world that's got all these like conflicts of interest like this this is your job this is what keeps your family fed you don't want to talk about it um you know and other risks of being like a pariah for some reason in your community or something (laughs) it's hard it's really hard for some people to talk about it Tammy can I can I jump in on that one about Justin you're absolutely right that's a great point by the way Justin I I've toured several people politicians and whatnot and just our toxic tours and this is one of the things I want to make like people like out in southwestern Pennsylvania who actually have been impacted one of the hardest things is always kind of reopening the wound and telling stories in these toxic tours opening up and always having to like go back there which is so brave and so strong to me when you came out I have to tell you I had no problem with you like as somebody when I towards you like it was a whole entire different conversation i felt comfortable to divulge everything to you including like things i didn't feel comfortable about trying there was no face like i was just like this is how i feel about (laughs) pretty much anything and you really do have a great way of getting the truth out and i also feel like it's very safe with you that whatever we've told it stays in with you and that's a really good ethic but i i just think about like people who have been out the the toxic tours is something comes out touring people around all the time, like just to show people like what you've been going through on top of it. Every single time you tell that story or I have brought, brought people to people that impacted people's place. I feel terrible because you're always asking them to reopen a wound every single time. And I, I've watched some very strong people break down every single time. And like, to me that having a person like you out there that like when you come out there, like, and we tell your story, it actually feels like it's going somewhere. Just got to give you that props, <laughs> actually. I mean, storytelling, being a journalist can be a form of extraction as well. You know, you, oh, yeah. you can practice yeah. a toxic way. You can take something, like you say, very charged and very valuable from someone and 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 just kind of splash it out into the world in a way that isn't thoughtful. And then that can be just mm-hmm. as extracting coal, oil, and gas out. So, you, you know, you have... Um, your own version of a Hippocratic oath that you have to follow for your trade, for our trade, storytelling, journalism, writing. Um, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. So when you, um, when your book comes out, it's April, right? Yeah, um, you're going to be going into communities and doing like events, I imagine, um, and talking to people and um, probably meeting lots of new people and uh, figuring out your next book. <laughs> um, just before and we have, um, you know, a few minutes left or whatever, but um, before we go anywhere, I'm just curious, just thinking about all the stuff that you've done and you're finally publishing this book that um, I've been anticipating for years, um, and I know other people have, but now I'm super curious, like what's next, like what, um, where is this going to take you, um, for your next sort of adventure of curiosity? Yeah. Um, well, first is, is like making sure the message gets out. So I see comments in the chat about, you know, people in in really good groups in Ohio, Ohio makes up really important parts of the book. And I want to go back out to Ohio, to Pennsylvania, and I will be, things are already being set up and, and, you know, speaking on this issue. Because again, there's, 
um, you know, there's nothing like being right there, especially in the places things are happening. So I'm happy to connect with any group. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'd love it. If it's a small library with like six people, that's fine. Uh, you know, I'll do it as I can. Uh, and bigger settings also. There's musical things being planned. There's more scientific things being planned, but I'm really going to try and get the message out um, in as many ways as I can. And of course, there's a book now, so there's a form. So again, if you can get it to, you know, ensure that a local bookstore in your area has it, that's really helpful because then we can have an event at a bookstore and people can really easily access, you know, the thing, which here is a book. Um, but there's also things I've learned, Tammy, on this topic that I just couldn't fit in. I tried in many different ways because I feel they're important. There's some of the more detailed nuances of radioactivity and, and just how I'm learning radioactive elements move through the human body. In some cases, finding these incredible papers, again, these early papers going back to the atomic era, how polonium moves through the human body, where it goes and why it goes where it goes. And um, and yeah, I it might take me a bit to get to that, but it's it all could make it in there and at some point you know i really want to be able to to just follow up on um on you know some of the other aspects of this um, which certainly have a public an important public health component that is exciting um can't wait to see that and learn more about that myself um that's can super I, interesting um, local bookstores I, sorry go ahead um, I just well, want to, I just, there's like five minutes left. I just want to make sure know, that we answer the questions that were. Yeah. I just um, want to make sure that the, the, the local bookstore form is on there because I, I I'm I've been here and I don't know I want to I want to help that so. That's Harry's there's a form. workshop. Yeah, I can put okay, those cool. back in. Thank but, you. Um, in the last five minutes or four minutes, if there's um, any more questions, um, Tinia, can you let us know from the um, Q and A? There are. Um, I'll do the short one. Does anyone know if deep well geothermal projects test for radioactivity or might those wells be a source of exposure? It's a fantastic question. So the same exemption that exempts oil field waste as non-hazardous actually also exempts geothermal waste. Um, which, you know, was always a part of the energy mix in this country, but always a pretty small part. It's getting a little bit more attention. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there is a concern with radioactivity being brought to the surface uh, with geothermal. I haven't dove in as deep on the research. Um, so it's harder for me to talk about uh, with complete authority. But from what I have read, it seems like the levels, in most cases at least, are significantly, while elevated above natural background, are lower than what you're often finding with the waste that's coming up with oil and gas. Um, but there still would be issues expected down the line as you're trying to deal with that um, waste stream. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an important topic. I mean, you pull stuff out from the earth, the earth has, has like hidden all these harms, you know, beneath this beautiful veneer that we call the surface. Uh, and there's always going to be an issue and there's always going to be, you know, um, you know, kind of studying how that will, what it will do at the surface as we maneuver around or pile it up. Thank you for that. I don't know if you'd like to make a closing statement or if any of the panelists or moderators have a question or comment. I, I think I have one and it's for Justin too. Um, I don't want you to give it away, um, but I know your book does ask people to like take action. And um, I'm wondering if you can like close out with any kind of like sort of inspirational things that people can actually um, take away from tonight and, and what they can do about it? Yeah, yeah I think, um, I think the, there's, there's really important conversations that need to be had across the board. So even if you're not in an oil and gas state, um, for example, right now I live in the Northeast, a lot of uh, solar projects, wind projects are coming in and people are opposing them um, for reasons I sometimes understand and reasons I sometimes, you know, get really upset about because I think there has to be a recognition 
of what the energy producing parts of this country, like the harms that have been, that have happened there and what these people have had to endure. And if you want to live, if we want to move past this and we're laying out all these harms here, we want to move past this, you know, those of us in places that aren't in oil and gas country are going to have to take on something. And that something might just be looking at a windmill like eight miles offshore, but we're gonna have to like take some of the burden of being an energy producer. Uh, and, and so I think there's even outside of oil and gas country, there's important conversations about how, what you really have to do as a community and a citizen of this planet um, if you want to move past this thing. And it, and it means you will, you don't have to accept radioactive waste in your backyard, but you're gonna have to you know, bear some of the burden of, of trying to ha you know, have this kind of high tech glossy life we have. Um, and those are conversations beyond this topic. And then just you know, connected, more connected to the topic. Yeah, have, you know, do what you can with the tools you have, whether it's an event at a library, at a local university, try and engage local journalists. There still are some great local reporters. Um, and really that's the key because the thing read at the state capitals where decisions are being made is probably not my journalism. It's not Rolling Stone, it's not DSmog. It's gonna be the local newspaper of that state. And, and, if, and journalists, I've seen this happen in Ohio and other places, you know, journalists get turned on, they will cover this topic. And, and the more people run with it, the more other journalists can get permission from their, you know, editors to run with it. And that's a way to build also. So just, and then of course the health community, just build the awareness, um, build the awareness. It makes it easier for everyone to then build even more awareness. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for building the awareness yourself. Um, you know, sharing all these stories with everybody. It's been um, amazing to get to know you. And I look forward to working with you, um, you know, as long as you're, as long as you're at it. <laughs> um, yeah. So thanks for meeting with us tonight. It was really fun. And uh, we wanted it to just kind of feel like a conversation because we've all had so many like brilliant conversations with you when we were doing our studies or, you know, all the different times that we've met you touring and whatever. Um, and we, uh, in a way, I kind of just wanted to use this webinar, not as like a typical like type webinar, but I kind of wanted people to get to see also like your personality a little bit mm -hmm. because it's one of the best parts. <laughs> um, you know, not just the uh, journalist who's, whose articles I want to read, but somebody that is um, amazing to know. Um, so thanks for being with us. And thanks, Chris and Laura and Tinye yeah. for your help making it happen. I'm going to say this, Justin. I love that you're sitting there with all the clothing and your scarf and whatnot. Like it, it, it says a lot about you. There's some style about you that it's awesome. This is so, so comfortable about you. It's like it's human part of you that it is also like the reason why it's awesome to see you in person and have this conversation with you. And when we hang out together, I which I hope is in April, right? Just to, to do this book thing. I can't wait to meet you again because I had the greatest time just uh, meeting you. You have a great energy. And I also, yeah. Background is interesting. <laughs> I know you got a store going on there. It's my partner. Um, there you go. Speaker. So, um, awesome. Very special, different art form being practiced here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Thank you all so much for, for putting it together. And thank you, everyone, for mm. attending and really good questions. That's good. So uh, yeah, um, everybody in the audience, keep your eye out. We are going to be working with Justin when the book comes out in April. Um, and we look forward to hopefully capturing you as audience members again. Um, all right. Thank you for all your work, Justin. Bye-bye. <laughs> and Laura and Tammy and Jenny. Okay, good night. Thank Bye -bye. you.